John Hess from Filmmaker IQ. Today I'm going to discuss how to cover a live event with multiple cameras as a solo shooter. This video is made with help from Angikiss, who sent me a couple of their Sabre 4K Plus cameras to use in this demonstration. So quick little shout out to Angikiss for that. Let's talk directing a live event with multiple cameras. Now, when I say live event, I'm talking about a show or meeting that takes place in a central area or a stage. I'm going to leave it very broad and open to apply to a lot of different kinds of live events, from corporate meetings, school award programs, and even musical recitals. Now, furthermore, I'm going to limit this to multi-cam productions that can and will be edited later not live streaming broadcasting, which presents another set of challenges. This video is designed to give you some tips and strategies on how to approach these types of projects, especially if you're a solo or a very small team, which is really what a lot of budgets can now only afford. So let's get started with the primary question. Why are you shooting this? Now, obviously the reason you're shooting an event might be because someone's paying you. That's obvious. The why I'm getting at is what is the purpose of the final video? This question is crucial to how you design your setup. As a solo or a small crew, you have to know the best way to utilize the resources at hand. And if you know why you're capturing what it is you're capturing, then you know what it is to focus on. Conversely, knowing why you're shooting may even lead you to shooting it as B-roll instead of actually as a live event. Now, here are a few examples where live production makes sense. You are shooting a presentation by a guest speaker that will be later used for internal training. Perhaps it's a lecture series being put on by a historical society and they want a video to go for their local cable access channel. Or perhaps you are recording a recital and the program will be used by the musicians for review. Now let me give you an example of one of the regular events that I record to explain how I approach these projects. I work for several school districts and we put on a student of the month program that is sponsored by the city's chamber of commerce. These videos of the event will go onto YouTube and then sent to the city's PEG or PEG public education and government channels for play throughout the month. So I know what the deliverable formats are, but I still really haven't answered the question of why. Why are we recording this? We record these videos to provide a record of the event so that the students have a memory of their speech and so they can share this award with their families who may not be present at the actual ceremony. So with that in mind, I know my focus is squarely on the students and the speeches they make, as well as the principals, teachers, and parents that present with them. Essentially, nothing else in the program really matters. It's like that old joke. You had one job. Well, capturing the students in that moment is my job. Do I need to shoot B-roll of the breakfast that's being served? No. Do I need to include acknowledgements of all the dignitaries and sponsors every single month, which are the same every month? Not for what I do, but check with your clients first if that is something that they are going to need. So really understand the purpose of what you're being asked to record. The final deliverables will dictate how you set up everything. Sound first and foremost. When a client asks me to record a live event, they really want me to make a solid professional quality audio recording first and foremost. You've heard that old saying that audio is half the picture. With live events, I feel like audio is almost 90% of the job. You screw up the audio and the video is pretty much useless. Who wants to watch a one hour live event with terrible sound? Absolutely no one. And nowadays with everyone with their cell phones out and recording these events, the difference between that video, that cell phone video and my video is actually how good my sound is in comparison. So audio needs to be your first job. Well, luckily it's not that hard to get good sound. You just have to keep it top of mind. I don't wanna to get too deep into setting up sound here. I did talk about it in my basics of multi-cam production video. Also, if you own an audio recorder, you can always record sound separately from your video and then marry them together in the edit. Something that I almost always do as access to the sound equipment in the room is usually far from where I like to set up my base of operations. For recording sound in a set it and forget it fashion, recording 32-bit floating point is nice in that you don't need to set your levels, but still, 
sound check and make sure you're actually getting a signal and just don't hit record and walk away thinking you got something. 32-bit float isn't entirely necessary as you can accomplish a lot of the same things with 24-bit. Just do a quick sound check with the audio system you're going to use, speak with your loudest voice, and get those peaks just under minus 20 dB. With that much headroom, I've never clipped anything important in hundreds and hundreds of these setups I've done in the past. I may make another video on how to do post sound from an event in a future video if there is interest, but let's move on. The Operator Static Model. Multicam requires you to obviously have more than one camera, hence multicam. The most basic setup with the least amount of equipment and personnel required is the Operator Static Shot Model. Paired all the way down, we have you, the operator, on a single camera, and another camera locked off to shoot a static wide angle shot. For this, you can have different cameras. The camera you're operating could be your primary camera, and the locked off shot could be something simpler like an action cam or even an older camera that you're no longer using. With the operator static model, your main camera will be the dominant shot you use 90% of the time when you go to edit the event altogether. You will only use the static camera as a way to break up long takes or as B-roll to cover up cuts in the edit. For shooting events, I highly recommend working with a fixed lens camcorder with a servo control zoom. Adding a zoom rocker to your tripod and you can pull off smooth zooms with a lot of precision. Let's talk about camera placement. The simplest setup is to put your static camera right next to the camera that you're operating. This allows for easy access and monitoring, but it limits you basically to one angle with just two different framings. If you do shoot this way, make sure on the camera that you're operating that you don't zoom out to the same angle as your static shot. If you do that, you have nothing to cut to, essentially forcing yourself into a shot until you zoom back in far enough that you have a visually different shot. Another option is to place the static camera in a different position, perhaps high on a light stand grabbing the entire room, or even a side angle. With that kind of placement, you will always be able to use it as a cover angle. But if you're not continuously monitoring the camera or have easy access to it, triple check that you have continuous power to the camera. Plug it into a wall socket if you can. I've grown to like using larger batteries like the Sony NP style batteries or the larger V-mount gold mount bricks that supply practically an inexhaustible supply of power, at least during the day. With the operator static model, you can take an aggressive approach to moving the camera you're operating. Find your shot and move quickly to establish it. This will give you the most flexibility in the edit. However, you can get a little too aggressive and don't do that. Remember to keep the final product in mind. Let speakers complete their senses before them moving the camera. Allow ideas to complete before moving on. It often helps to imagine cutting to that static shot before you make your move. Since you are actually operating a single camera, this gives you the most flexibility when recording a live event with continuous, unpredictable motions, like a presenter who isn't anchored to a podium and wanders around the stage, or a dance recital. Now, there are some variations you can add to the operator st static camera model. You can bring on a friend to act as another camera operator. I know that's kind of cheating. In a situation where there is no director guiding multiple camera operators in finding their shot, I would give operators a few guidelines to follow. First, never stop recording. This is to simplify the syncing process. That way you have one large file you sync once and you're good. The second is always shoot with a soft touch. That means always assume that your angle at any moment may be used as the final angle. Don't reframe aggressively because you never know when I might need to grab your angle when I'm editing. Another option if you can't bring someone on or the budget doesn't allow it is to add additional static cameras. This will give you even more cutting options in the edit. I've done this with a piano recital. Since all the action is right there at the piano, having a couple different extra static shots adds a bit more interest to the final video. But it is pretty wasteful on resources, and if you're dedicating a camera and the resulting data to perform only one function, which, depending on the subject, may not be utilized that often in the final edit, it's kind of a waste. Instead, you may want to consider remotely controlled PTZ cameras. The 2PTZ camera model. 
PTZ camera setups is really my favorite approach for shooting live events with a predictable staging. I would use this for award ceremonies, corporate presentations, even some recitals. What I would not use this for are events with unpredictable movements like the aforementioned dance recital. Even that wandering speaker can be hard to track for a PTZ camera, although a lot of new tech is coming out that has tracking capabilities, so hopefully I'll get to explore those options more in a future video. Also, PTC cameras aren't the cheapest things in the world. Not if you want a solid performing one, but if you do this work on the regular, they offer a lot of benefits. Operating multiple PTZ cameras is a bit like a juggling act. It's a different thought process than just focusing on operating a single camera. It forces you to think ahead and prepare, which is frankly why I think even though it can be nerve wracking, directing multicam is really kind of fun. I'm not gonna get into the setup of a multicam solution today. You can reference my previous video. I will mention that I use the Blackmagic ATEM Mini Pro ISO. ISO means it records isolated camera feeds. So each feed coming in is recorded by itself. Then every cut you make on the ATEM Mini is recorded into DaVinci Resolve file so you can edit your edits after the fact. Something that has saved my butt many, many times. For the cameras, today I'm using these two Angie Kiss Sabre 4K Plus PTZ cameras. This one offers HDMI and SDI outputs and a 12 times optical zoom, which is great for an event in a small banquet room like this. Now I would put these two PTZ cameras at different parts of the room to create multiple angles. The only time you would want the cameras next to each other is if you need two close-ups from the same general angle. Example I run regularly is shooting a city council dais where the council members are lined up in a row and you might need to cut between close-ups between two different sides of the table. I'm gonna walk you through some strategies for an awards presentation event. This is a student of the month presentation, which is a joint venture between the school districts and the local chamber of commerce that I mentioned earlier. The way these presentations go is there's a podium, which all the action takes place is centered on. An MC introduces the program and keeps the show going. Each presentation includes a person giving the award. That person will speak about the award recipient. Then the award recipient will speak and then they will introduce the next recipient, rinse and repeat. With PTZ cameras, you have the option to set up preset camera angles. For an event centered around a podium, what I generally do is create at least three different presets. I go from wide to close. On this podium centered camera, preset one is my wide angle to get a view of the room. Preset two will be my medium wide angle and preset three will be my close up which in reality is more like a talking head mid chest shot. You can organize it in whatever way you would like, but I use these presets as a starting point for the final framing of my shots. I will do this for both of my cameras. Actually for my second angle camera, my preset one is a wide of the podium side and two is a reverse angle of the room and three is a medium close up on the speaker at the podium. Now I have essentially six different preset shot angles I can jump to during the meeting, which will serve as the basis before I further fine tune each of these shots. But not all of them make sense editorially all the time. When a meeting first commences, I will usually open up with the wide angle shot in a classic continuity style editing. You wanna visually establish the location of the meeting, especially if your client spent some serious money renting a nice space. Then as the podium presentations continue, you wanna push closer to fill the frame with the speakers. By the way, I always start the recording five plus minutes before the official start, so you should never get caught off guard by a nervous MC who just guns it to the podium and kicks it off without alerting the video staff, and that has happened to me multiple times. Now with two cameras, you are essentially bouncing between two different cameras. You make a camera live, and then you work on the framing of the other camera. At the appropriate time, you bounce that camera live, which then frees up this first camera for reframing. Now you could leave one camera on wide and just cut back and forth as you would with an operator static model. And that's useful if you only have one PTZ at your disposal, but where's the fun in that? With two PTZs, what you wanna do is anticipate what is going to happen next in your event. Here, experience and confidence go a long way. During the transition between speakers, I might take a wide room shot. 
While that shot is live and the presenters are taking their positions, I'm working with the other camera to find a good medium shot. The person giving the award will speak first, so I'll use my medium shot preset as a starting point and finally just so that both the speaker and the recipient are both in the shot. Now this is an editorial decision you have to make on the spot when there's more than one person standing on a stage. Who do you center on? This is why I spent so much time talking about why are we shooting this? Because this is an awards presentation, you wanna see the face of the recipient when other people are talking about that recipient. You might catch a laugh or a funny anecdote or even a, a tear at a powerful story. Those things would be missed if you just laser focused on the person at the podium. This is why the why matters. It guides your choices in shot selection. Once I get that medium shot, I'll take that shot. Now I'm turning my focus on the camera with the original wide shot, which isn't live anymore. I'll take my close up preset and reframe it for two people. I'll take that camera when it's ready. Now returning to the other camera, I might reframe it for a close up or leave it on a medium shot and give myself something to bounce back to as a cover in case people start shifting and I need to reframe my close up. Once the recipient gets up to speak, now my focus on framing will be the recipient only. With an awards presentation, the focus is on the award recipient. I don't necessarily need the reactions of other people around the podium. If I had more cameras, I might have one trained on other people, but we want to make the best of what we have. At this point, I might have both cameras centered and close up on the podium. I do like to have one camera zoomed in a little bit closer than the other so that the cuts between the two cameras don't look like spatial jumps. With two cameras, don't overdo the editing as it will make apparent that you only have two cameras pretty quickly. And I usually like to sit on an angle for a good chunk of time. Remember that your job is not to show off how good your editing skills are. Your job is to capture what's happening at the event. So don't let the cutting between cameras get in the way of that. Once you sense the recipient's speech is coming to a close, start preparing for an exit. If both your cameras are in a close-up mode, move one to a medium shot to anticipate traffic that's gonna be eventually happening on the stage. When they leave and the next set of speakers come up, the whole process then again repeats itself. Now, a couple things to keep in mind. Because I tend to place my cameras far from the action on the stage, you want to avoid making PTC movements on a camera that's live. From a long distance away, camera movements can look a little bit stiff because the angle you need to move the camera is so small that it's hard for PTZ mechanisms to pull off in an organic move. It's even hard when you're operating a tripod unless you have a very nice fluid head tripod setup. You can alleviate this if your camera is much closer and using a wider angle shot. Because you don't wanna make live camera movements, there is a tendency to tunnel vision on moving cameras that aren't live and ignoring the live shot. This is not good. Remember the live shot is what you show the world. If someone repositioned themselves so that say their head is cut off in your live shot and you're too busy hunting around for your second shot to notice it, well, that's something that can't be fixed in post. In such a case, speed is key. A few seconds of bad framing isn't the end of the world. It happens. You have to notice it right away and quickly cut away from it. Then go back and fix the framing of your original shot and then cut back to it. But give yourself a few beats to make it look like you meant to do that all along. Now regarding speed, when things are moving in a meeting, it's always better to have a shot ready quickly that isn't perfectly framed versus a perfectly framed shot that wasn't ready in time. For this reason, you wanna shoot wider than you're used to. That way framing errors are less noticeable. Lastly, the trickiest part about operating multiple PTZ cameras that still gets almost everyone who does this is moving the wrong camera. You'll have camera one live and you think you're moving camera two, but your controller is still operating camera one. To minimize this from happening, I always select which camera I want to move before I even touch the joystick. Even mentally say to yourself, camera two, select the camera before you actually move the joystick. Still mistakes can happen. When they do, don't panic. If you're recording ISO on the A10 mini, you can go back and fix those mistakes so long as your other camera is usable. Otherwise, well, your options are limited. Perhaps you have a nondescript audience wide angle shot from another point in the show you could drop in to cover the mistake or just live with it as an error that you will promise to never make again. And it happens. 
Here's a little insight into my workflow. When I shoot a two camera PTZ setup like this, the live edit is always further edited to create a final video that I release to the client. In the edit, I will marry the high quality sound, which I record on an audio recorder, add compression and noise reduction, and then cut out the boring bits, which are people moving on and off the stage and add any lower third graphics that might be needed. I could do the graphics live, but I can make better animated graphics if I do them in post. Plus, I'm always a little paranoid that I might make a typo live at the event. Now, what I covered so far is in relationship to a two camera PTZ event. Increasing the number of cameras can be both harder and easier. Harder in that you have a lot more camera angles and options to keep in mind, but also easier in that you won't find yourself in a lot of traps that come with only two camera angles to bounce between. You can also mix and match PTZ cameras and human operators. Taking a look at your standard TED Talk video, you can see at least one human operated camera following a speaker around the stage. I don't know the exact setup, but the reverse shot could easily be a PTZ camera. On even larger multicam shows, such as live events for broadcast television, well, it's a whole different beast that I'm not particularly familiar with. Two, two, three, four, 39, 15 next, two of three, three, two, three, four, 41 next. Two, two, three, four, 41, 24 next, A, 10 next, two, two, three, four, looking at you. I do sense that a lot of planning goes into those shows. Those shots are planned more or less beforehand and the director is following a script while the show is happening. So while it looks intimidating and daunting, and don't get me wrong, it, it is, it's not the same thought process required to switch live switch a two camera PTZ show with no rehearsals and just flying by the seat of your pants. Again, thanks to Angie Kiss for sending a couple of their Saber 4K Plus cameras for me to try out. If what I mentioned intrigued you into getting PTZ cameras, give Angie Kiss a try. Hit like, subscribe, ring that bell if you want to throw a tip at me. There's Patreon. It's always appreciated. I've hoped I have given you some insight into how to conduct these live multi cam events. Now, all it's up for me to say is to go out there and multi cam something great. I'm John Hess, and I'll see you at filmmakeriq.com. <laughs>